All right. Hello, uh, Red Earth team. I hope you guys are doing wonderfully well. Uh, Matt Ham here offering uh, a little bit of encouragement today, hopefully, uh, and, and an opportunity for us to kind of pause everything that's going on in the world around us right now, because it's certainly crazy, and really tap into um, just a moment to maybe learn, uh, to be challenged, and to grow. Uh, in this season, I, I feel like the, the real heroes of this season um, are those who will, are willing to do the inner work. You know, right now there's a lot of outer work going on uh, in our environment, in our world. Uh, as we all know, we're getting used to phrases like social distancing and, you know, coronavirus and all the stuff that's going on with that. But those are all external factors. And so often what we deal with when we're walking with people is the external factors are actually what dictate the internal uh, settings. So the external factors are what actually dictate the peace of the heart instead of the peace of the heart living beyond the external circumstances. And so when I say the heroes of this time are those who will be willing to do the inner work, I mean those who come out of this season better than they entered it will be those who are willing to do the inter inner work. And, and I really believe that. I really believe that we as a people can come out of this season better than we entered it. And, and there will be those that simply don't, and there will be those that, that do. And my hope is that we will be those uh, who do. And so with that in mind today, my heart and my uh, encouragement and my challenge is aimed at the inner work so that we can come out of a situation better than we entered it. And... <clears throat> I'm going to use today a, a teaching, if you will, from my book, Redefine Rich. Now, part of what John has allowed for the team is um, a copy of my book, Redefine Rich, for anyone who wants to um, have access to it. That's the book there. And uh, if you don't have it, do make sure that you message me and I'll get it mailed out to you. Uh, but it's a really powerful idea that our wealth does not determine who we are, but who we are determines our wealth. And with that being said, the, the, the book is really an acronym of four principles, R-I-C-H. And the R principle is the principle that I want to focus on today. Now, you have to understand, I went to a school that is an uh, engineering school and an agricultural school. So when I said I was going to write a book, people thought I was crazy because I was more of a talker than a writer. I'm not a liberal arts guy. I'm not a writer, that kind of thing. But I was so compelled in my life that I needed to write this book that I just sat down and began writing it. And I wrote the book as a young 30 one year old kind of wrestling through life with the challenges of kids and, and family dynamics and finances and faith and work. And, and I was really wrestling with this concept. So the book was birthed out of a really uh, challenging moment for me to kind of self discover what I was really about, who I really was, because I was trying to define myself by how much I had by how good of a dad I was, by how hard of a worker I was. My identity was wrapped up in the external, going back to what I just said. The external was determining my identity instead of my identity, who I was living beyond the external. Um, and this all might sound like pie in the sky, you know, deep spiritual, whatever, but it is the absolute truth of how we were created to live. The inner is always greater than the external. And we can actually live in such a way that we can live beyond our external circumstances, which is why there are certain people who just have joy and peace and all of these things, no matter what seems to be going on around them. doesn't mean that there aren't difficult moments. It doesn't mean we don't have a bad day, but it means that our entire life can be lived from a place of freedom instead of a place of a responsiveness or a reactiveness to our circumstances. Right now, there is no greater time and opportunity for us to live beyond our circumstances, but we have to do the inner work. So that's kind of the introduction. So the R principle, the first principle, came to me when I was writing, and it was this idea. You would not aspire to great wealth unless you recognized that you didn't have it, right? And you wouldn't aspire to wealth to be rich unless you realized that you were in fact broke. And so I kept wrestling with that phrase in my hand, recognize you're broke. 
as related to finances. And then the N came on the end of the word broke and it was recognize your broken. And as I was writing about that, it seems a little bit harsh, recognize your broken. But it is such a profound idea that without the recognition that we in fact are broken, we cannot have a true desire to be made whole. Without the recognition that we don't have financial wealth, we couldn't have, in fact, the desire to improve our financial situation. So a recognition is, is a key part, but the brokenness is a key part as well. So as I'm writing this book, some crazy things began to happen. I'm, I'm writing a book, first book I've ever written, and I felt like the Lord was really introducing me to all these different people that was kind of like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. You remember Dorothy goes down the, the yellow brick road and she meets the scarecrow and then the tin man and the cowardly lion. Well, I am meeting people along the way in my journey who are necessary for uh, what it is that um, I needed. If you if you relate this to The Wizard of Oz, you know, the, the scarecrow didn't have a brain, the tin man didn't have a heart, and the lion didn't have courage. But what Dorothy had to model in this journey of the Yellow Brick Road is she had to model her own brains, her own heart, and her own courage as a way to tap into what she was put there to do, which was defeat the Wicked Witch and get back to home and all that kind of stuff. Now, I know it's a dream and blah, blah, but it's metaphorically speaking about Dorothy's journey and her need for brains, heart, and courage in order to achieve what it is that she was after in her own life. So for me, as I was stepping into this, it was like Dorothy, and I met people along the way who were telling and showing me things that I needed to learn. And, and that's about the time I met a gentleman named Gary Weller. Uh, Gary Weller uh, came to me via a, a group a business meeting. He was a speaker, and he came rolling in in his electronic wheelchair, and he's paralyzed uh, from the waist down, and he's giving his story. And as soon as I heard him speak and tell his story, I was compelled that this was for me and that this was for this book, okay? So I didn't seek it out. It just came to me. Now, if you open the book and you and you read, you can read about Gary Weller's story um, starting around page 51. But for those of you who haven't dove into the book yet, I'm going to paraphrase it for you. So uh, Gary Weller was a high school football coach in the town of Fayetteville, North Carolina, uh, Pine Forest High School. And he was well loved by all the community. He was a big man, former football player. He coached some at East Carolina University. Uh, he had a lot of ties to the University of Chapel Hill. And Gary Weller was kind of an icon in this city, this small eastern town in North Carolina. He was known as Coach Weller, and he was a very physically fit man, very strong. And so one day in April, uh, he decided, I'm going to drive my car to the mechanic, and I'm going to leave it, and I'm going to run back home. It was about a four-mile run. Not a big deal for him. That's just what he wanted to do. Now, his wife said, honey, I don't like when you do this. You know, can I pick you up? He said, no, babe, I'm fine. So Gary took his car and he parked it at the mechanics and then he went for a run back home. Well, little did Gary know that there was a deranged man that particular day who had made it his intent to run over men with his car. Uh, this, this man was kind of a... Um, a radical uh, religious uh, person, and he had a moment of breakdown where he decided to get in his car and just drive over people. And so as Gary was running, he saw a white van that was actually a stolen utility van pass him, and he didn't, reckon, he didn't think anything of it, but it turned around, and it came, and it ran him over from behind. And as Gary was running, he was run over by this gentleman in the vehicle, and the gentleman backed over him and then pulled off over him again. And Gary was left in the road for dead. Gary was uh, the, immediately the, uh, you know, 911 was called and they sent in an airlift team and an ambulance. And when the ambulance uh, got there, they said that Gary was almost unrecognizable as a person. Uh, every bone in his body had been broken except for his skull and his spine. His hips were crushed, his legs were crushed, um, and his arms were crushed. He had internal bleeding and he was in a very serious way. The helicopter airlifted him. He had to be resuscitated uh, five or six times in the process. And he was put into a coma for, I believe, two months. And when Gary awoke from the coma, he recognized and realized that his life had completely changed. 
Everything that he had was now gone. Everything that he enjoyed was now gone. He couldn't go for runs anymore. Uh, he couldn't be out on the football field. You know, he couldn't do the things that he loved to do. His life was completely changed. But, you know, in that moment, Gary was actually fighting for his life uh, because there was so much damage to his body. They wanted him to, just wondering if he would ever live. But after the coma, when he awoke, he had to spend two years on his back recovering from this situation. And in those two years, a couple of profound things happened. Number one, Gary recognized his condition, that his body was completely broken. But he also recognized that he was not going to let the new circumstances define his life and define who he was. And, and he chose in that moment to take on a new posture, a posture of hope, a posture of gratitude, a posture of forgiveness, a posture of responsibility, and he chose to move on. Now, here's the powerful thing. At the, well, what happened with the gentleman who ran him over, actually after he ran over Gary, he ran over a father and son and actually killed them that day. But Gary did not die. And so this man was put into a capital murder trial. And at the capital murder trial, Gary felt compelled to forgive this man in public. And he said that in forgiving him, it was one of the most profound um, moments of his life because he was truly then freed from the, the pain of the situation. And so as I met Gary and got to know his story, it was so overwhelming to me, the truth underneath this that was what was there. And so using Gary's story today, I want to talk about four different aspects of this inner work of recognizing that we're broken. Uh, you know, we don't like to do the inner work. In fact, uh, our world tells us, ah, man, it's going to be okay. It'll be okay, right? You know, this will this will pass and it'll be all right. And you, you pat, we get a pat on the back and go, you're not broken. Don't, don't worry about it. But that is not helpful. What is actually helpful is to face the brokenness head on. And so the first aspect of this is recognition. We cannot move beyond the conversations we are unwilling to have with ourselves. We have to have the difficult conversations with ourselves. We have to look in the mirror and analyze our own heart and understand and recognize the true condition of ourselves. You know, Gary could not change his circumstance. He had to recognize that he was going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life, but he had to fight to regain mobility in his arms. And I'm telling you, this man is one of the most heroic, courageous dudes I've ever met. I love Gary and his family. I've had the opportunity since to connect with them multiple times. He has a charity in their town of Fayetteville where they do a Spartan race, one of those warrior races out in the woods, people going through the mud, et cetera. And they've asked me to come and speak for that and, uh, and do a fundraiser. Someone recently in their community um, was, was crippled by suicide. Uh, a family was, and Gary stepped up to begin raising funds for this family. He's just a, a true, true uh, hero, and his legacy is just incredible. So Gary um, modeled this idea of recognition, and the idea of recognition is you can't move beyond what you're unwilling to face. And so right now in this season, when we're locked down with coronavirus, a lot of us are inside, a lot of us you know, are seeing reduced capacities in our work. We're having to face some difficult things. We're having to be alone with ourselves. We're having to be in quarantine with our family. You know, um, I know for me right now, my wife and I, we've got five beautiful kids, but we are inside pretty much with them most of the day. And so emotions run high, tensions run high. But what an opportunity for me to truly love my kids in that environment instead of uh, putting it off and not recognizing what is actually going on here. So recognition is the first step in, in healing any broken place in our lives. Uh, the second is forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness is uh, that, that, that giant word that we feel like, you know, we have the, the ability to wield it. You know, it's the sword that we carry. And either people, you know, you get my forgiveness or you don't get my forgiveness. And it's my decision. And, you know, we, 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 we own our forgiveness like a badge of honor and, and yet withhold it as a badge of honor in many cases, especially to the deepest places where we've been offended, the deepest places where we've been pained, the deepest places where we've been hurt. But that is, in fact, um, not what forgiveness is about. Forgiveness is not a feeling. 
And that's one of the powerful things that Gary um, really taught me is forgiveness wasn't about how he felt because Gary was hurt. Um, Gary was upset. There was anger. There was despair. There was depression. There was a lot of difficulties that he faced. But forgiveness rather is a choice. It is a choice that we have in the moment uh, to begin to heal and to begin to give our forgiveness. You know, I write this in the book and 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 the idea is, um, let me see if I can find it here. Forgiveness. This is on, yep. Refusing forgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. This is page 66 in the book here. Um, forgiveness. Refusing forgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. What a powerful, powerful thought when we understand that forgiveness has nothing to do with us, uh, with nothing to do with them, and everything to do with the other party. That we have, um, let's say that right. Forgiveness has nothing to do with the other party. It has everything to do with us. It doesn't matter if someone deserves to be forgiven. It doesn't matter if someone apologizes. Forgiveness transcends uh, what we see outside. So we have to choose forgiveness in our life. I would say that one of the most powerful exercises that I engage on a regular basis is to ask myself and seek my own heart and see if there is anyone that I need to forgive that I've been harboring anger toward, or if there's anyone that I need to ask forgiveness from. Uh, just yesterday, very vulnerable moment, uh, we had our boys, we have three boys, nine-year-old, twin, eight-year-olds, and as you can imagine, everything is a competition. So they were competing in the backyard and playing basketball, which ended up in a fight in tears. So I decided to jump in and play, and uh, it happened again, and I lost my temper, and I acted in a way that I shouldn't have acted in front of my sons. And I went upstairs uh, after everybody calmed down and I sat down on the floor with my boys and I looked at them and I said, boys, I am sorry. That is not the dad that I want to be. And I ask you to forgive me. And it's a powerful moment when we look at those we love, especially, and we ask their forgiveness for things that we have done. And it's incredibly freeing. But yet, it doesn't matter if the person recognizes your apology. It doesn't matter if they actually recognize your forgiveness. You have to give it, um, ask for it freely. So it's not only about um, giving forgiveness and choosing forgiveness in your relationships. It's about asking for it as well. So it, recognize you're broken, doing the inner work. Again, recap here. Number one is recognize it. Number two is press into forgiveness. Forgiveness is not only about giving it, it's also about asking for it, right? Now, the third part here of this is the powerful topic of blame. Blame. Um, blame is the opposite of empowerment. In fact, when you blame things, you're actually giving those things power. And so when you blame your past, when you blame your finances, when you blame your parents, when you blame your boss, when you blame your coworkers, when you blame your clients, you're actually giving those things power over your life and power over your condition. You know, if, if, if sales are off and you say, well, it's just the market, well, you're blaming the market, that means the market has power over you. Anything you blame has power over you. By contrast, anything you forgive, you are free from. Anything that you choose um, not to blame, you, you, you have power over. And so this is a profound thing that a lot of folks really struggle with because we get offended very easily. Uh, the way that you know our culture engages on social media or on the news or the way our president acts or the way the other party act, whatever. We, we blame all these things as if fixing them would actually fix the situation when in fact, what we need to fix first is ourselves. And we need to understand that we cannot have authority over anything we blame. In your life, you have authority over your life. You're given jurisdiction, dominion over your life. Therefore, you have authority. Once you blame something, you give that authority away. So in the process of doing the inner work, begin wrestling with your blame. Begin wrestling with the narrative. Uh, for me, this took uh, the form of, of my uh, baseball career. I was a pretty good athlete growing up. Always made the all-star team, you know, all that kind of stuff. Played baseball in high school. 
But during high school, I had a really rocky relationship with my baseball coach. Uh, baseball coaches changed my freshman year of high school. I didn't get along with the new coach. I kind of had a chip on my shoulder. He had a chip on his shoulder, and it was oil and water. And so by the time my senior year came around, I had pretty good statistics. I had the capacity to be able to play Division One baseball. Um, I was being recruited by North Carolina State University, an ACC school. And uh, But yet I just um, – I was so frustrated with my coach and my energy was in the wrong place that I decided to hang up my baseball jersey. Now, the powerful part about this is that, you know, for years and years and years, probably 20 years, not quite 20 years, 15 years after I graduated from high school, I blamed my high school coach as the reason why I didn't uh, play baseball in college. And one day I really felt convicted by the Lord and I was just like sitting there and he said, why have you not forgiven him? Why have you continued to blame him? And I was like, that's weird. That's this 15 years ago. I'm not going to forgive this guy and I don't need to write him a letter. And, and kind of God laughingly said, OK, well, uh, about two weeks later, I was driving through a neighborhood behind my work to go get some food. And I pull up to a stop sign and I look ahead of me and my old high school baseball coach is cutting the grass in this yard in front of me. <laughs> it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. And as soon as I saw it, I felt something inside me say, now's your opportunity. Now's your time to forgive him. Stop blaming him. And I parked my car and I got out and I walked over to this coach and I looked at him and I said, man, I have held this against you for 15 years. I've blamed you as the reason why I didn't play baseball in college. And I just want to say, I'm sorry. And uh, I forgive you. And, and I ask you to forgive me. Now his eyes were like this big around and it was awkward. And he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know? Yeah, sure. Okay. It was very postured and all that kind of stuff. But I felt a level of freedom after that because the truth was finally out. I decided not to play baseball in college. It was my decision. And that decision freed me up to be able to meet my wife. And my life is where it is today because of that decision I made, not because of something that was done to me. I'm not a victim of the situation. I'm a victor over it. It has made me into who I am. So blame never wins and it's never good. The final piece here is uh, response. When you're dealing with your own brokenness, you have to choose your response. Uh, Viktor Frankl wrote a great book called Man's Search for Meaning. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian doctor who was imprisoned in Auschwitz during World War II and saw some of the most horrendous treatment of human beings in the history of our world. And out of his experience, he wrote Man's Search for Meaning. It's a profound book that I would encourage everybody to read if you haven't. But here was the culmination of what he learned at Auschwitz. Circumstances beyond our control can take everything from us in life except the freedom to choose how we will respond to those circumstances. In the book, he gives a great um, analogy of patients who thought that the war, would, would, the war would be over by Christmas. And he said the number of deaths that happened after Christmas was staggering because people weren't dying uh, from any disease they didn't have. They were dying from loss of hope. Once they saw that the war was not ending at Christmas, they began giving up hope. And their response was hopelessness. And that's what actually killed them. Instead of responding uh, by having the choice to choose how they could respond. And that's in fact what um, he teaches us and what the fourth point of uh, overcoming brokenness is. And that is response. Response is a short version of the word responsibility. We have a responsibility to choose how we react and respond to the circumstances around us, including coronavirus, including right now with shutdown and lockdown and all that kind of stuff. So how are we going to overcome this situation? We have to do the inner work. Number one, we have to recognize. Number two, we have to pursue forgiveness. Number three, we have to reject blame. And number four, we have to choose our response, and that is our responsibility. Um, in closing, uh, I share this in the book. It's a powerful analogy, and it's dealing with forest fires. Uh, scientists have actually proven that forest fires are necessary for a thriving um, um, biology in, in, a far, in the forest, right? Ecology, I think is the word. For a thriving forest, it needs a fire. Why? Because what happens is the trees grow up and they build a canopy 
so that the nutrients from the sun can't get into the soil. But what has to happen is when a fire comes through and burns off, it actually burns down all the trees and the nutrients and returns the nutrients to the soil to make the soil rich to continue to allow the, the fire, the forest, excuse me, the fire allows the forest to thrive. Right now, I think we are in a forest fire situation. We're in a purification situation. Uh, COVID-19 coronavirus is nothing more than a forest fire. And it's burning off the things that aren't needed to return the real nutrients into the soil, the soul, the inner person uh, that need to be there so that we can thrive and grow. Um, it, it's just forced us to do that instead of uh, maybe those who, who haven't chosen to do it as a part of their natural uh, dynamic of life. But the point is, is that we can choose this every day, moment by moment, and that's who makes us into, that's what makes us into who we are. So that wraps up today's um uh, call and, and this idea of recognize you're broken. Again, if anybody does not have a copy of the book, Redefine Rich, uh, feel free to to grab it from me. And I would love to, uh, to share that with you. Uh, with that being said, um, you guys have a great day and we'll talk soon. Uh, to those who...